Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's great to see all of you here tonight. I hope you had a good day. I hope you're ready to have a good time in here this evening. Let's get started. As always, we're going to stand. We're going to sing hymn number 542. 542, Jesus loves even me, maybe even you. Let's sing about it, all three verses. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of the love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms I would flee When I remember that Jesus loves me I am so glad that Jesus loves me Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me I am so glad that Jesus loves me Jesus loves even me Oh, if there's only one song I can sing see the great king this shall my song in eternity be oh what a wonder that jesus loves me i am so glad that jesus loves me jesus loves me jesus loves me i am so glad that jesus loves me jesus loves even me Aren't we glad that Jesus loves us? Welcome tonight. Good to be in the nice, cool building out of the heat. Good to have folks watching from all those states I mentioned this morning and maybe some others I don't know about. But tonight I'm talking to people in the auditorium from the land of the big canoe. <laughs> you didn't know that about Missouri, did you? Now you know. You learn all kind of things when you come to Crossroads Baptist Church. Welcome. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to be with the people of God, to have health and strength and joy in our hearts, to know that we have you with us always, even to the end of the world, to know that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you've given to us graciously eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for that privilege. Help us grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Root out the sin and rebellion that lurks beneath the surface of our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please have a seat. And please turn now to hymn number 570. Hymn number 570, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. All three verses. to tell you what I think of Jesus since I found in him a friend so strong and true I would tell you how he changed my life completely he did something that no other friend could do no one ever cared for me like Jesus, there's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms around me, and he led me in the way I ought to go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no Oh, how much he cares. 
just why he came to save me till someday I see his blessed face above no one ever cared for me like Jesus there's no other friend so kind as he no one else could take the sin and darkness from me oh how much he Noticed I have a cane. I have this cane. It's got my name and address on it, by the way, in case you try to steal it. But I have this cane for several reasons. It helps me take the weight off my injured foot. It keeps Kevin straight. <laughs> this little point right here is for him. Boink. I'm looking forward to using it. The next time he stands up here and says something ugly about me. So if you see me reaching for my cane, do not warn him. I want it to be a secret when I bop him on the back of the head. But thank you, Brother Bragg, for donating this cane to me and giving this cane to me. On my birthday of 76, I am using a cane, but I plan to get off it. As soon as I go to the doctor on August the 31st and he tells me what the problem is and fixes it. I would be willing to have a foot implant. How about a foot transplant? Anybody got a left foot you want to donate? What size shoe you wear? What? Seven and a half? Oh, I need a half size larger. Who wants to donate a size 11 left foot? I'll even take your right foot. I have two right feet. Would not be the talk of the town. All right. Fall semester begins Tuesday night. 16. What time are you starting that up? 6 p.m. And then the 50th anniversary of David and Sharon. That is coming this weekend. The 20th. Drop in at 5. Meal from 5 to 7. Celebrating their birthday. Now, they live out toward La Russell off Highway YY, but the problem is between here and their home on the other side of a villa, the road is under repair and you have to detour. So if you're planning on making it, go see David, come see him tonight or Wednesday night but, but during church, after church, and get directions how to get around the detour and get to their place. Be a wonderful thing to help them celebrate. 50 wonderful years. And then the couple's night out on the 26th. Couple's night out. That means the children will be kept by the Waltons. Sign up on the table in front of the sound booth. And that's our announcements for tonight. Thank you, church. Kevin asked me if I was going to open the envelope this morning. The answer was no. So, but I opened it afterwards, and here's what you gave me. I have two gift certificates one to Mies Arcos to eat, and one to Boomer Sooner to eat. I see you think I like to eat, which is true. So thank you so much. That's about all Adele and I do anymore for fun and just eat and look at each other. And when she looks at me, her eyes just well up with adoration <laughs> and devotion and love and sympathy. She loves me. I look at her like that too. He told me that when they first met, she just rolled her big eyes at him and he picked them up and rolled them right back. <laughs> Didn't know what to do with them. I know what's coming. <laughs> I was also going to tell you that he, you know, he mentioned again tonight that Missouri is the land of the big canoe, right? What he didn't tell any of us this morning is that back where he's from is known as the land of the big cuckoo. So. <laughs> All right, we better sing, don't you think? Let's stand up for our offertory hymn, hymn number 484. 
484 on Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye. All four verses. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. All o'er those wide extended plains shines one eternal day. There God the sun forever reigns and scatters night away. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. No chilling winds nor poisonous breath can reach that healthful shore. Sickness and sorrow, pain and death are felt and fear no more. I am bound for the promised pray for us. Glad to have you back from Atlanta. His wife is still over there with family. Let's pray. Lord, we just are so grateful to be in your house tonight, Lord, to uh, worship you, and Lord, we just pray that everything we say and do would be honoring to you, and uh, Lord, we just thank for it, all the ways you provide for us, and uh, we thank for the opportunity to give back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
of his great love, he lifted me up, set my feet on a solid rock. Out of his great love, I learned the meaning of salvation out of his great love. I had gone astray, I had lost my way, when I called upon his name. Then he rescued me, now the song I sing. What a loving God is he. Out of his great love, he lifted me up, set my feet on a solid rock. Out of his great love, I learned the meaning of salvation out of his great love. Now I shout his praise through all my days for his endless mercy and grace. There's no other one who has greater love. With joy I will ever see. Out of his great love, he lifted me up, set my feet on a solid rock. Out of his great love, I learned the meaning of salvation. Out of his great love, out of his great love, he lifted me up, set my feet on a solid rock. Out of his great love, I learned the meaning of salvation. Out of his great love, salvation out of his Thank you very much. Beautiful. 1 Samuel chapter 15. I'm going to continue the little theme I've had for a few weeks about authority in our lives. Tonight we're going to deal with witchcraft. Witchcraft, but not the kind of witchcraft you may be thinking of. Have you ever done something in your life that at the beginning of doing it, or when you did it, it seemed like a very small, insignificant little thing? And then later on, it just caused you so much grief, so much worrisome, so much trouble, so much anguish. You, probably, you thought you probably shouldn't do it, but it's just a little thing, so you went ahead and did it. I remember when I was a senior in high school, my friend Lonnie and I had cut school. We'd gone to see his father down the country. And uh, on the way back, the little oil light came on on his 49 Ford. And I said, Bo, look at that. Your light's on. He said, don't worry about that. It happens all the time. Not a big deal. I guess within five or ten miles, we heard a boom and, a, and smoke billowed out and threw a rod, and it was just a mess. And we got stranded on the highway coming back to town. And we were way out in the country because his father lived way out in the country. So we glided to the shoulder of the road and caught some rides back into town. And that's when my father had caught me cutting school because the Marine Corps recruiter had come to the house looking for me because I wasn't at school. Uh, the Marines will get you in trouble every time. I knew I should have joined the Navy. Did I just say that? <laughs> I'm losing my mind. But I got caught. We had some repercussions from that at home and at school. There was a man in the Bible that did what he thought was just a little thing. But it had huge repercussions down the road. It cost him greatly. It cost him dearly. It's a story about Saul... His rebellion against God, and God calling that rebellion as the sin of witchcraft. The sin of witchcraft. Now, nobody here tonight would say that witchcraft is a good thing, unless you're totally out of sorts with God. I mean, any Christian wouldn't say that. The sorcery and seances and trying to contact the dead and Ouija boards and casting spells and witchcraft is a good thing. Nobody would say that. We'd all say it's a bad thing. Now, Saul is not guilty of casting spells or anything like that. By the way, he's not the only one involved in witchcraft 
all of us have been. If rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, we've all been there because we've all rebelled against God at some point in our life. He did something seemingly trifle that was going to cost him the kingdom and eventually his life. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now this is a very important chapter in Scripture. It shows what can happen to us if we follow the footsteps of King Saul. Now, I'm bringing this message, number one, for young people. Do not give in to the rebellious streak that you have, the rebellious temptation that Satan's throwing before you. Number two, parents, pray for your children that they do not go down the pathway of rebellion. If they follow in the footsteps of King Saul, they're going to have some disaster in their life down the road. I'm going to bring three lessons tonight from Saul and rebellion. Number one, partial obedience is still obedience. Excuse me, partial disobedience. Partial obedience is still disobedience, what I'm trying to say. Partial obedience is still disobedience and rebellion. God gives Saul a clear command. Let's look back at it. Look back at what he says. Chapter 15, verse 1. Samuel said also unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now, Saul, go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And Saul gathers together his army, 200,000 plus. God says, go wipe them out, Saul. I'm, it's payback time. The chickens have come home to roost for Amalek. Because when my people were coming out of Egypt, they attacked them. And tried to destroy them. And he's going to punish Amalek for the things they did against Israel when they were leaving Egypt. He says, Saul, go and destroy them. Amalek is the enemy of God. You have an enemy. You have three enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. They're enemies of God. He tells Saul, blot their name out from under the sun. Wipe them out. They're your eternal enemies. Because Amalek will rise up and destroy Israel if Israel does not try to destroy Amalek. But Saul, being a rebellious nature, decided not to do what God said to do. He decided to do something just a little different. He did mostly of what God said to do, but he didn't do everything God said. He spared the king, he spared the best of the oxen, the best of the sheep, the best of the animals, best of the people, and destroyed the rest. He saved some back for himself. Now, when you get to 2 Samuel chapter 1, when Saul dies, here's how he dies. He's in battle, he's wounded. He does not want the enemy to kill him. He falls on his sword, but the sword doesn't kill him. So a man comes along, and Saul says, Who are you? And he says, I'm an Amalek. I'm a Malachite. Would you kill me, please? And he slays Saul. He kills him. And the Amalekite goes to David and says, What happened? And David kills that Amalekite. Saul spared Amalek, but Amalek did not spare Saul. And the Amaleks are the enemies of Israel forever. They're still over there, folks. They're surrounding the nation of Israel. Enemies forever. And then when you get to the book of Esther, you remember a man named Haman. 
Haman was a dirty, wicked, conniving, higher up in the government of King Ahasuerus. He hated Mordecai the Jew. He hated all the Jews. He came up with a plan to have the whole nation of the Jews in their city wiped out. You know who Haman was? He was a descendant of the Amalekites. The Amalekites are the enemies of Israel. Always have been, always will be. God sees the end from the beginning, so he says to them, wipe them out, destroy them, utterly, do away with them. They will not repent, they will not listen, I want you to do this, Saul. So Saul goes out to do it, but he partially does it. He spared the best of the things, and the king. And God comes and says, you've turned back from following me. You have grieved my heart in this. So I'm going to take the kingdom from you. You won't do what I say. It's going to cost you. Partial obedience. We don't like to think of it this way, but it's the truth. Partial obedience is still disobedience. If you tell your child to clean up your room, and they go in there with a sour, scouring attitude and do it, that's partial obedience. If God tells you to do something, and you do it with a sour spirit, that's partial obedience. We kind of take God's commands like we do the cafeteria. Nobody goes to the cafeteria and gets everything on the buffet and put it on their plate. Nobody does that. What do you do? You pick and choose. I like a little bit of this, and a little bit of that, and a little bit of those, and then I'm done. I don't want the salad. I don't want the fruit. I want the potatoes. I want the meat. I want the good stuff. But you pick and choose. And we do that with God and His Word. They pick and choose. We pick what God wants us to pick up to a point, and then we choose to neglect the rest. And we think, God, you ought to be happy with me because I did most of what you said. I did most of it. Now, God's not happy about that. He's not happy with Saul because Saul wouldn't do it all. When you want to obey God, you have to do it fully and completely. When a child wants to obey his parents, you have to do it fully and completely. When an employee needs to obey his boss, you need to do it fully and completely. When a school child needs to obey a teacher, you need to do it fully and completely. When you need to obey the law, you do it fully and completely. You need to do what Mary said to the servants in the wedding of Galilee. Whatsoever he saith to you, do it. Just do it. Don't bicker and fuss and debate. Do it. Even if you don't understand it. And we don't understand it. Kill all those people? Strike Amalek? Wipe them out completely? Don't leave any of them breathing? We don't understand that. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So we must obey God's commands completely. And we need to obey God's commands humbly. Not just completely, but humbly. One of the key components in the problems of Saul is this. He had so much pride. And I talked about pride this morning. Pride is one of those things, the moment you think you have it, you lose it. So we cannot go around saying, I'm so humble. I don't have any pride. I'm just a humble, humble, humble man. You strive for it, but you don't ever pat yourself on the back and say, okay, I finally got there. When you think you have it, it escapes you. How do you know Saul was proud? Because he set up a monument to himself to glorify himself. If you're King Saul and you're full of pride and you win a big battle, you pat yourself on the back. What do you do? You set up a monument. Does anybody here think that we know better than what God knows? And yet we so often do, what, do different than what God says do. We don't know better, but we do different, thinking we can have different results. We can't. Nobody has a better plan than God. He knows the end from the beginning. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We're not as wise as God, so we cannot be proud. We cannot be disobedient. We cannot hit and miss on the obedience to God. 
Now, here's the way some modern Christians hit and miss on obeying God. A lot of modern Christians no longer see the value of a church. They don't. They become the unchurched generation. They still consider themselves close to God and spiritual. They don't watch a church on TV. They don't have anything to do with the church in their own lives. They don't have any way to serve God or give to God. They don't have anything to do with the church. Their way is better than God's way. And you know what does God say? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. Don't be like that. But a lot of people just want to be on the fringe. They don't want to be faithful to God anywhere. Anywhere. Well, you know what, Brother Morgan? I can worship God on the golf course. You don't. Even if you could, you don't. I've been on the golf course enough to know people talk about God a lot, but they're not worshiping. They talk about Jesus a lot, but they're not worshiping. Well, I can worship God at the beach. Well, you could, but you don't. You go to the beach to relax and refresh and have a wonderful time. None of our ways are better than God's ways. Here's another way. Well, I know, Brother Morgan, I got saved. and The Bible says I need to be baptized, but I don't think I need to. I don't think I have to. I think my way is better than God's way. And God plainly says, Go ye therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to get in that baptistry and be embarrassed in front of a congregation of people, come up there with my hair wet, looking like a drowned rat. I don't want to do that. You need to follow the Lord in obedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. And disobedience is as the sin of witchcraft. God hates witchcraft. How about giving? Well, I don't tell you. I don't tithe because I can't afford to. Did you know that the statistics tell us that 20% of a congregation gives 80% of the offerings? 20% are supporting the church. The rest are contributors along and along. So many people who claim to be saved are stealing from God week in and week out. Now, Brother Morgan, that is Old Testament stuff. The tithe is the Old Testament. I live in the New Testament, the age of grace. Listen, in the age of grace, you ought to give more than they did in the Old Testament. But Jesus commended giving in Matthew. He said to the Pharisees, you give a tithe of the mint and the anise and the cumin, you ought to do that. But don't, un don't leave the other undone. Don't leave it undone. God commanded it in the Old Testament. Jesus commanded it in the New Testament. Who in the world are we to cancel it out? Do you know who I've noticed who wants to cancel out tithing? People who are greedy and love money. It's not just the poor people, but people who don't want to give to God. And they say, I'm giving my time. I'm giving my time. That's not what the word tithe means. It means 10% of your income. So, partial obedience is what? Disobedience. You teenagers, are you partially obeying God and your parents? I mean, when they watch you, you're obeying. When you're, they're not, you're sneaking around. It's as the sin of witchcraft. It's what God says. Number two, from verses 13 down to 23, we see that rebellion is as bad as witchcraft. Rebellion is as bad as witchcraft. And I read verse 23 to you. Now let me tell you what I know about rebellion. You cannot hide it. It will surface in words, deeds, expression on your face, and body language. It always shows itself. You think you can hide it, but you cannot. It will leak out and slip out. Samuel shows up. Hey, Samuel, Saul says, I did what the Lord commanded. I destroyed Amalek and all of his stuff. All the people, I obeyed the command of the Lord. And at that moment, the sheep start, bah! and the oxen start lowing. And Samuel says, well, what is this I hear then? If you have obeyed God fully, why am I hearing this? 
Sometimes you see people with rebellion in their heart and rebellion in their life. They don't want to do what God wants them to do, and it's obvious. Now, they're not in witchcraft so much as sticking pins in little dolls and casting spells and stirring a cauldron of frog eyes and stuff, but rebellion reveals itself because rebellion opens your heart and life to Satan. Satan is the chief rebel of the universe when he was Lucifer. And that's why God says it's as the sin of witchcraft. Not casting spells and going to seances and cursing people and sticking little dolls, but there is power in witchcraft and in Satanism. It's demonic. So rebellion links you up with the devil. He rebelled against God's authority, and he convinced, we believe we convinced, a third of the angels to follow him in his rebellion against God. And he drew them with him out of heaven when God cast them out. So Satan has rebellion in his heart. And when we become rebellious, we become like him. We don't want to bow the knee, surrender the heart, bow the head, surrender the will to God Almighty. And we're giving the devil access to areas in our lives. And he will put up a stronghold there. He will set up shop. And there he will attack you. Have you noticed any of these countries that really are in wonderful climate and temperatures around the world, but have become nothing but big garbage dumps? It's because the devil has control of those countries. He's in control of those nations, of those lives. They squander and they live in squalor. When the devil is king, places become garbage dumps. And when the devil is king in your life, your life will become a garbage dump. He sets up shop. You become not demon-possessed, but he has a stronghold, a foot in the door. And you know what I have noticed over the years? And this is sad to say, but it's so, so true. Sometimes we parents teach our children to rebel against authority. We do it ourselves. What? What? You got a C, and I know you deserve an A. I'm going down there to that school, and I'm going to give that teacher a piece of my mind and make her change her grade. What? You're sitting on the bench, and you're a better player than that other boy is, and you're sitting over there, but the other boy is the favorite. I'm going out there and give that coach a piece of my mind. What? You heard what the preacher said, and you didn't like it? Well, I'm going to go up to that church and give the preacher a piece of my mind. I'm going to stand up against him. Sometimes parents teach their children to rebel against authority. We teach it to them. God wants us to respect the position and the person in the place of authority. Because of Saul's rebellion, God took away the kingdom. Took away the kingdom. And boy, he was miserable after that. I mean, he did not immediately take it from him. It would be years. But his life became a garbage dump. The Lord, the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, the Lord departed from Saul. Look at verse 14. The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and the evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. An evil spirit overwhelmed him. God took his hand off Saul and let the devil take control. If you go on in your rebellion, God can do that for you. I don't know that he will. Pray, pray and hope that he won't, but he could, and he could. He might. And Saul became terrorized by an evil spirit, and God ceased to protect him. I wonder if anybody in our church is troubled by an evil spirit. I think I know of one who very definitely is, maybe some others. One of the ways you can tell when you're troubled by an evil spirit is you can't control your emotions, especially the emotion of anger. And sometimes you just blow up. It doesn't seem like a big deal to anybody else, but to you it's a big deal, especially when you are confronted. 
especially when authority is demanding obedience and you don't want to obey. That's the way Saul was. Saul was troubled. He got so mad at his own son Jonathan, he cast a spear at him, a javelin. He tried to kill him because Saul, Jonathan was friends with David. And then Saul spent years chasing David, throwing spears at him, trying to kill him. And then he went to one town. He'd heard the news. The people at Nob were befriended David when he was running from you. So he goes to Nob and kills 85 priests because they gave David some bread and water and sanctuary. I mean, that's what rebellion will make you end up doing crazy things. He even killed the women and the children, the infants of the city. And Saul just became paranoid and psychotic. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Well, it's just a little thing when I say, in your face, mama, it's not a little thing. It's a big thing. Number three, rebellion, to overcome it, requires genuine repentance. Genuine, heartfelt repentance. Repentance. So you rebel against God. You have to make it right. You have to get your heart right. Saul is the poster boy how not to repent. <laughs> he never did do it. What can we learn from Saul? Number one, when God confronts you about your rebellion, and he'll do it through your mom, your dad, your teacher at school, your Sunday school teacher, your preacher. He'll do it through some adult or either some other Christian. When God confronts you with your rebellion, don't lie about it. That's what Saul did. He lied about it. No, no, Samuel. I obeyed the voice of the Lord. I did every, well, most, I did a lot of everything that God wanted me to do. And Samuel said, Saul, you're a liar. If you did what God said to do, I would not he be hearing the bleeding of the sheep. So quit lying about it. Confess to God, Lord, in my heart, I don't want to submit to authority. In my heart, I'm a rebel. I'm a rebel. Now, sometimes it comes out in my actions. Secondly, stop blaming others for your rebellion. Stop blaming others for your rebellion. Saul liked to blame others. If you read this passage, you'll say, well, you know, I did this and I did that, but the people, now the people did this and the people wanted that, so I did what the people wanted. They wanted to keep the choice things. That'd be my, like me saying this. I'm going down here and rob SMB. I'm going to get $50,000 out of SMB, and I'm going to come to church next week and give about 40000 of it. I'm going to do a good deed. I'll do a partial good deed. When God said destroy them utterly, he meant utterly. So don't play the blame game. It's my fault. My, it's my mother's fault I'm this way. It's my daddy's fault. It's the coach's fault. It's the teacher's fault. A lot of people play the blame game. Husbands play it. Wives play it. It started early in the Garden of Eden when Adam blamed Eve and then Eve blamed the serpent. God will never, never, never accept excuses. It's not my fault. It is your fault. It's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, that's at fault. Look at chapter 15, verse 30. Instead of repenting, he says this. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord thy God. He really didn't repent. It wasn't a confession so much as an admission. He wanted to look good in front of the people. And that's what most of us want, really. We don't like to be dressed down in front of people, to look bad in front of people. We want people to think we're a little bit better than that. So the third thing is this. Do not place more emphasis on your reputation than your character. Be more concerned about your character than you are your reputation. I want to look good before the people. I don't want to get right with God, but boy, I don't want to look bad before the people. He was concerned about his reputation. You know, it really doesn't matter how we look before the people if we're wrong with God. 
It really doesn't matter. What does our heart look like to God? Now, David is also a man who sinned greatly. But Saul's response to his rebellion and David's response to his rebellion when he committed murder and adultery, I mean, look, his sin was really greater than Saul's. Saul disobeyed God not killing people. David disobeyed God with a murder and adultery. But the difference is this. When confronted with their sin, Saul made excuses. David repented. He was not a perfect person. He rebelled too, but he didn't blame anybody else. It's the people, it's not me. I'm innocent. Blame somebody else. He said, it's me, O God. I'm the one that did this. Have mercy upon me. And he got his heart right. The need of the hour in our lives is to be honest and not blame, lay the blame at anybody else's feet when we mess up. But get our own hearts right with God. Now I want to tell you one thing and then we'll be through. One thing that produces rebellion. No, excuse me. What rebellion produces more than anything else in a person's life. What rebellion produces more than anything else is anger. Anger at your mom. Anger at your dad. Anger at your teacher. Anger at your coach. Anger at any authority. Any authority. Because you're just angry all the time. And that's the way Saul would live the rest of his life. The Lord's the only one that can take that from you. If that's you. I hope we'll have some people that'll say, God, search my heart and try me. And see if there be any wicked weight in me. See if there be any rebellion in me. And forgive me. Have your way and take over. Have your way and take over. So let's bow our heads and let's pray. Our Father in heaven, search our hearts. Prick our hearts if you see rebellion. Prick our hearts if you see an insensitivity towards you, a callousness towards you. Prick our hearts if you are aware that we have anger seething beneath the surface. Prick our hearts if you see that we don't like being under the umbrella of authority, that we want to do our own thing no matter who it hurts, and we are willing to pay the price, we think. Prick our hearts and deal with us. And see if there be any wicked way in us. And cleanse us. Lord, we do not want to lose the young people of our church to rebellious hearts and minds and spirits. We do not want them to open their lives to the witchcraft of rebellion. Lord, please, capture their minds and hearts and wills while there's yet time. And I pray the same thing for adults. Some adults have totally given over to stuff like that. But I pray for them too. When the piano begins to play, now here's my invitation. You may not need this personally. If you do, I hope you'll come and pray. You know in your own heart and life whether you're obedient, partially obedient, or flat out rebellious toward God and His Word. You know that. But then many of us have children and grandchildren we need to pray a hedge of protection round about them so the devil will not slip in and cause them to be led down the path of rebellion, which is as the sin of witchcraft, opening their heart's door to Satan. You pray for them if you can't pray for yourself or don't need to. You pray. Get God's help in your family on these things. Won't you come?
Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. And thank you, those, some of you who gave me notes and cards and gifts and some food, and cards. I appreciate every one of them. They're a blessing to me. And I mean that. I have learned over the years to show appreciation for small acts of kindness and thoughtfulness, sometimes big acts. But thank you. Thank you very much. God bless you. See you Wednesday.